Hey Stormliners, welcome to the Rhythm of War Gem Heart Theories video. Obviously, this is going to contain spoilers for all the books before Rhythm of War, all the Stormlight Archive books before Rhythm of War. Uh, it will also contain some mild spoilers because I've read uh, the Rhythm of War chapters that have been released so far to date, which is October 9th, 2020, and through chapter 14 has been released. And so there will be some supporting evidence. These theories, I came up with all of these theories before the Rhythm of War chapters were released, and I feel like uh, for a couple of them at least, the Rhythm of War chapters have just supported, further supported these theories. And so our first Gem Heart theory will revolve around the Parshman and the Parshendi and their differences. And I believe the differences is that the Parshman do not actually have a heart, a Gem Heart specifically. Uh, so my first Gem Heart theory, uh, we'll start with a quote from Ashenai, and this is in her prologue in Oathbringer, I believe it's page 23, it says, a captive like in a gem heart, and she's talking about a sprint here. Uh, they've built devices, specifically she's looking at a Fabriel that King Gavilar is showing her, that mimic how we apply the forms, how we change our forms, in other words. And so this and other information from the books tell us that Parshendi forms change, differ, based on the gem heart that's in, uh, the sprint that's in their gem heart, on the gem heart sprint. So we know that that's true. That's how they change forms is the, the specific type of spren they take into their gem heart and bond during a storm. And then we also know that dull form comes from bonding the wrong type of spren. And I believe this is from Esh and I as well. My conjecture, uh, and so the first part of that statement, it does come from bonding the wrong type of spren. That's from the books. I suspect that it's from bonding the non-intelligent forms of Sprint or from bonding something that's specifically incompatible with Parshendi and with the Parshendi gem heart. Gem heart bonds, uh, and this is a conclusion that's based on the books and from words of Brandon, gem heart bonds make both the Sprint and the animal more intelligent, more sapient. Uh, there's a symbiotic relationship that's described between the animal and the Sprint, and this is been pretty much confirmed explicitly by Brandon. And then the quote part is from Eshenai, and she's describing slave form, and she differentiates it from dull form. So dull form is a form that Parshendi can take on. Slave form is only Parshman. Uh, slave form, she says, wasn't really a form at all because it has no spren, no soul, and no song. We're going to talk about the spren soul connection in a little bit, but I believe that the soul of an animal or a Parshendi uh, will reside in their gem heart. Basically, uh, the soul of any Rosharan native that has a gem heart is going to reside inside their gem heart along with their spren uh, in a kind of a connected little relationship there. But the slave form has no soul, has no spren, and cannot hear the rhythms, presumably, because no song. Uh, so keep that in mind, that's true. And then a word of Brandon goes even much further to say that the Parshman, even if they were taken out into a high storm, th that they did not have the ability to change forms at all pre-Everstorm. So the Parshman could not have bonded a spren, even if they were taken hand in hand with a spren um, and into a high storm, it would not have happened. So you can ask yourself, knowing how the Parshendi bond spren, what's the one thing that would have prevented them from bonding spren if they were in a high storm? Well, the obvious logical conclusion to me is that the Parshmen lacked gem hearts, that they did not have gem hearts. And I've presented this theory before and the argument was made that that's, um, that makes them biologically different from the Parshendi and that they are not biologically different from the Parshendi, but according to Brandon, they actually are biologically different from the Parshendi. So here's another person basically asking if a Parshman was given some sort of investiture, like a storm, or specifically here, like multiple breaths, uh, would they be able to be become sentient and become more like a listener? And Brandon says, no, that would require first some sort of identity changes and transformations, specifically biological 
transformations for them uh, because they've adapted and evolved away from whatever it is the Parshendi have that allows them to transform. And what did the Parshendi have that allow them to transform? A gem heart. Uh, so to further answer why they may have adapted and evolved, let's talk about BAM. I call the unmade BAM. Uh, I believe it's pronounced something like, but I also believe I'm going to butcher this, ba Ado Mishram, but I always say BAM. And so BAM was the unmade spren who supplied singers with void light. And so she would give the singers all the void light they needed. And she was imprisoned for 45 hundred years. And specifically during this time, uh, the Parshendi would have been out on the shattered plains or wherever they were, and they would have been drinking in the natural creme water that occurs on Roshar. And so they would have been getting investiture from the creme water instead of from Bam. However, the Parshmen would not have been drinking creme water, most likely, because they were slaves to the humans. And the humans would wait until the creme and the water separated. They would wait several days after a rain until the creme and the water separated, and then drink the water with very little creme inside, uh, as little as possible, because that made them sick. And so the Parshendi were getting investiture this whole time, and the Parshmen weren't. Uh, so after millennia of not having any spren, uh, and the Parshendi went millennia too without having spren, because they went millennia in dull form, not slave form, but dull form. Uh, and so they didn't have spren until recently too, but the Parshmen went millennia without spren and investiture because they weren't drinking the creme water. And so those two things together, I believe, are the reason that they didn't use their gem hearts because their gem hearts were never infused. They were never occupied uh, by spren. And so they didn't need their gem hearts. And so their gem hearts evolved away. And uh, before I go into the next theory, I want to talk about the spren soul connection, uh, which, you know, I'm showing a picture of Kaladin who doesn't have a gem heart, uh, but I believe that the spren soul connection is true no matter whether you have a gem heart or not. Uh, so whenever Brandon is asked, and he's been asked several times about his idea for spren, where did the idea of spren come from, he responds that everything had a soul. And so he's kind of equating spren with a soul. But I believe the spren that is in Roshar, most of the spren, especially the intelligent spren, reflect more of the soul of God or the soul of the God that they came from than a soul of maybe living things. Although some of the non-sapient spren do seem to reflect maybe the soul of fire or the soul of the particular plants that they inhabit. And then uh, you have the cliche that I don't believe is ever mentioned in Stormlight specifically or by Brandon specifically, but I do think that it's very related of the, the idea that the uh, eyes are the windows to the soul because the difference between dark eyes and light eyes appears to be spren driven. So if there's a spren connection or if they have descended from the Knights Radiant, possibly. Uh, if if they have those things, then they tend to be light eyes, or at least that's what it seems to be. Because if they're holding a spren as a shard blade, uh, then they go from dark eyes to light eyes. And Brandon has raffled, I believe, whether or not Cal's children would be light eyes based on if uh, when they were conceived if Cal had recently held Sill as a shard blade, would that make a difference in the color of their eyes? And uh, so that seems to be that it might actually happen. Uh, so we know that eye color changes immediately based on uh, having a, a spren shard blade, holding a spren shard blade. We also know, and this I think is really important, that the void spren all have red eyes, whether they're fused or not, and that the Prashindi who bond with a void spren, immediately their eyes turn red once they've bonded a void spren. So uh, this is a huge telltale sign that the spren that is bonded affects the eye color, and I think that's reflected in humans as well as the Parshendi. Oh, and another thing, and we'll talk about this one later, is that eyes burn out whenever 
a person is killed by a spring shard blade. And I'll have a quote for you in a little bit that says that this, the shard blade severs the soul and the eyes burn out as a result of the severed soul. So I think that's interesting. Also, when Spren lose their connection to humans, their eyes are scratched out and they become dead eyes. For the fused, we have a theory about a particular type of Parshendi, specifically the Parshendi who have bonded with a fused Spren. And when we talk about the fused, the books tell us that, and this is a direct quote, the fused are souls of ancient singers. So singers who were born and lived thousands of years ago, these are their souls. And then we're also told, and this is the most recently, but we've had hints of this before, that there are nine brands, that word brand is new from one of the Rhythm of War chapters, there are nine brands based on nine different spren varieties. And so you have the heavenly ones, that's one of the brands, and they are bonded with a different a spren that gives them gravitation, the gravitation surge. And then we have the altered ones who are like builders. And I don't know, but I think that they might be bonded with spren who give them the cohesion surge. We have the masked ones who are bonded with elimination spren. Uh, spren that at least supply them with the illumination surge. And then we have the husked ones who appear to be bonded to spren who give transportation surge. Uh, and when it mentioned brands, when the Rhythm of War chapter mentioned brands, it was by Vinley or through Vinley's perspective. And she said that the word evoked a meaning of heat or um, melting or something like that. And so you think of Cal's Shash brand and his Slave brand and his Bridge 4 brand that were with a hot, 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 hot iron burned into him. That's the kind of brand, that's the definition that this brand should evoke is heat or searing, um, burning. And the word fuse itself, I think a lot of people have maybe failed to notice or failed to recognize how the word fuse itself, I have the definition right here for you, evokes heat or melting or uh, combining together. And I like the third definition best. I think that when we talk about the fused, the third definition here is what we really mean, to stitch together by applying heat and pressure. And so you're gonna combine two different things by stitching them together. What are you going to combine? You're going to combine a soul and a spren. So if you talk about the fused, I think you've taken one soul of an ancient singer, and this probably the process happened thousands of years ago. And so thousands of years ago, they would take a living soul of a singer and they would take a spren particularly a void spren that had surge binding abilities associated with it, and they would melt those two things together, the spren and the soul. So already we know that Parshendi would have connected with these type of spren to grant them their surge binding powers, but they made the connection permanent. And they probably did that so they could have immortality because spren, as we know from Sil, spren can never die. Spren, you can't kill a spren, not really, because it's just an idea or a concept. They just go on to live forever and ever and ever. And if you permanently tie your soul to a spren, which is probably the logic of the Parshendi, then you will never die. And so that seems to be what they've accomplished. Uh, another quote, it says the process is not easy on them. Yep. Yep. That sounds like a pretty painful process to have your soul burned to a spren. Uh, so not easy. How close do you think, and this is a quote from Rabbanael, um, how close do you think they are, the humans are, to discovering they could trap us? And she's holding uh, the un an unmade in her hand or a sphere uh, gemstone that has trapped some sort of spren. How, think, how close do you think they are to discovering they could trap us like they trapped the unmade? Uh, forever imprisoned in a gemstone. So that kind of also shows us that they are spren, but their souls are tied to the spren. And so, uh, or at least I think that that quote in particular uh, helps support that the fused are fusing together their soul, their being with a spren. 
And so when you ask yourself the question, are our fused sprint or our fused souls? Well, they're both. The, the books mention both when they're talking about the fused, and they are, in fact, both. So uh, one of the nine void sprint that have surge binding abilities and one Parshendi soul, and Vinley speculates whether... Uh, that soul has to be old, or if if that is something that could happen to her. But uh, thank goodness, Timber is like, no, 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 that's not something that we want to do, because it sounds kind of like you're playing God to make yourself immortal. Uh, it's not something I would want to do either. Um, but if you are evil, <laughs> then when you create your brand, when you brand yourself to a spren, you gain immortality and power. And then, uh, this quote, further up the hierarchy were the fused ancient souls put in a modern body, and it extinguished the soul of the host completely. And the reason for that is because it's already a soul. It's already got a soul attached to it. It's got soul and a spren. So bonding that spren, because it already has a soul, two souls can't be in the same body, and so it kicks out uh, the singer soul that was already in the body. Thunderclast. So we get to talk about stone giants. Uh, we see Thunderclast almost from the very beginning of the entire series. These golems made of stone, and it's just uh, so fantastical. So uh, let's talk about Thunderclast and how to make a Thunderclast, because that sounds like a lot of fun, I think. Uh, so we know that we have all these chasm fiends and currently they're being hunted and maybe even to the point of extinction is what Shalon worries about uh, and rightfully so I would say but no we know that Roshar has existed for millennia we also know that the last desolation was four and a half millennia ago um, so we have a long history before chasm fiends, before we know that chasm fiends were hunted, where uh, chasm fiends have roamed the shattered plains at least, and maybe other places, and that they have died there. And this was probably before humans, or maybe even Parshendi, knew about their gem hearts and how valuable their gem hearts were. Uh, and so even their bodies just decayed naturally. And so that gem heart that was part of, part of their body then becomes part of the ecosystem and gets embedded in the bedrock. Uh, and so you've got, you know, archaeological types of places where you could find all these chasm fiend gem hearts. Uh, we also know or suspect strongly that chasm fiends bond a particular type of spren, the mandras, um, that give them uh, an extra buoyancy. The sky eels bond the same spren that allow them to fly. The great shells bond the spren, most likely, that allow them to float. Uh, and so the, the, the chasm fiends are these giant monsters that are so large and heavy that they should not be life, they should not be uh, limber and fast, and they, yet they are all of these things because of the type of spren that they bonded, the mandras. And so when we see thunderclast, we, we see a spren that looks like a mandra, but that has red eyes, that's a void spren in other words. So. And this is the Dalinar vision that takes him to the Pure Lake. He says the larger spren twisted, then dove downward into the water, vanishing into the rocky ground. So he's in the bedrock. And then right after this quote, the next thing Dalinar sees is this enormous thunderclass rising from the bedrock of the lake and coming through the lake and then terrorizing them. So uh, the implication is that the spren that went into the rock somehow caused the thunderclass to be made. Uh, and then here is an even better quote from Finley at the very end of Oathbringer, where we have the battle at Thalen City, and Finley got to watch the thunderclass awaken. Among the waiting spirits, and so that implies souls, were two larger masses of energy, and here it explicitly says souls, and not just any souls, but souls of singers, souls so warped, so mangled, they didn't seem singer at all. One crawled into the stone ground, just like Dalinar's, and somehow inhabited the stone like a spring taking residence in a gem heart. That's probably because inside the stone, there was a gem heart. And then the stone 
became its form. And form to me reminds us of prosciendi forms. So this is another form that uh, can be taken from a chasm fiend gem heart. So if you're inside a chasm fiend gem heart, this is another form that can be taken. And so what we've got here, it sounds like we've got another fused here. Although these aren't technically called fused, they're not part of the nine brands of fused for sure, because instead of boin um, binding a surge binding spren, this particular singer would have been bound to a mandras spren. And so the mandras spren is going to allow them to be uh, have thunder class that are lightweight enough that they can still be mobile because the stone giants, of course, would weigh so much that they couldn't even get off the ground if uh, if they were not given that buoyancy that they get from the special type of spren that they're bonding here. Uh, chasm fiend, he thought, and this is looking at a thunder class. Um, it looks like a chasm fiend, the head at least, the body was vaguely like a thick human skeleton, so uh, the body might be a little singer-like, but the head comes from the mandras sprint that is bonded right there. And then we have another gem heart theory that's related to Navani and related to the spren that we call the sibling and related to your theory. Uh, and I say unite them here because I think, uh, well, I know that the uh, an oath of the bondsmith is unite them. And that seems to be a theme of Navani, especially all throughout the end of Oathbringer. She seems to be even to me, a much stronger uniter than Dalinar Cohen. So she brings all of the leaders together into this meeting and she organizes the meeting and sets it up and, and does an incredible job of uniting all of Roshar together to fight the Voidbringers. Uh, so here we have a quote that is from Amazon, and it's the book description for Rhythm of War. And you can go to Amazon. That's actually a fabulous description. It gets me so excited about this book. So I encourage you to go to Amazon, search on Rhythm of War, um, and read it if you have not already. It may be the same on all of the bookstore sites, so you may be able to get this same description on other bookstore sites too. Uh, so Navani, the sibling, and your hero. Here we have this quote. Uh, uh, that makes me think that all of this is going to happen in Rhythm of War, um, that this is what Rhythm of what is going to be one of the major plot points of Rhythm of War. So as new technological discoveries by Navani Cohen, her scholars, um, but she's leading these scholars, uh, begin to change the face of the war. Wow, right? But we already see that in the first 14 chapters, too. Um, we see how powerful the technology she's developing could be, at least. Uh, and that scaring the enemy, the enemy prepares a bold and dangerous operation. We know what that is, too, now a little bit. Um, the arms race. That's so cool that we're going to have an arms race in Roshar. The arms race that follows will challenge the very core of the Radiant Ideals, and potentially reveal the secrets of the ancient tower, your Thiru, and that was once the heart of their strength. That's just like so powerful. Uh, the tower was the heart of their strength. I, I would think it would be the heart of their protection, maybe, because it's hard to get to uh, and very defensible, but the heart of their strength? I don't know. I've had a crazy wild theory that maybe your theory itself could fly and um, that's just seems crazy but um the heart of their strength i don't know that's just oh, so good um and then they do not have full access to the tower and this i believe is rubaniel speaking again so a fused who is uh claiming that the current night radiance don't have full access to the tower now that the sibling is dead uh and dead we must uh, I, really everybody says the sibling is slumbering and then later they call her a dead eye or close to a dead eye but i don't think she's quite as as dead as maybe maya used to be but she might be she might be pretty compatible with maya right now i don't know um and then we must strike now we must seize the tower from them so they're they're getting ready for that operation that is talked about and Nivani 
my theory, um, well, you know, is based off of the fact that she has united all the kings and all the kingdoms in Roshar. And she's, of course, doing this for her husband and with her husband, but she is a key integral part and maybe the most important part at the end of the Oathbringer uh, sections that uh, the most important impetus for them all coming together seems to be Navani. And so she's uniting them, and that's the Bondsmith Oath, unite them. Uh, your Thiru she describes, discovers and describes as a living thing with a heart of emerald and ruby and veins of garnet, a fabrial waiting on the sibling to awaken. So that's, that's, she, that's not in quotes, so she didn't say that. Um, but that's my conclusion that it is a living thing because it's a fabrial that can bond with a sprint to make it come to life. And we do know from notes that the Knight's Radiant left that your Ethereum is operated by one Knight Radiant and that one Knight Radiant always remains at your Ethereum to operate your Ethereum. The sibling is constantly conflated with your Ethereum. Good night, dear your Ethereum. Good night, sweet sibling. Uh, also, the your Ethereum and the sibling are said to be slumbering and a dead eye, according to Rabaniel. And then uh, we know from the Stormfather, I believe, that the sibling is a spren to one of the bondsmiths. So all of these things together really point to Navani being the bondsmith that bonds the sibling and will rule over your theorem. And then it just kind of naturally makes sense, right? You've got Navani, who is this highly renowned Fabriel scholar throughout all four of our books. You, you look at you know, the very first book and here's Shalon with this broken Fabriel and Navani's like, oh, that's okay. My mother is like this Fabriel guru. And so we'll just take it to her and she'll fix it because she knows everything there is to know about Fabrials. And who better to bond a fabrial spren than someone who knows everything there is to know about fabrials. So, uh, you know, she's qualified, eminently qualified, the best qualified person that we know, and that probably includes Ardens, the best qualified person that we know to, uh, to be a Knight Radiant to a spren that is operated by a fabrial. And also, she's the best qualified person we know to be the constant host at your Thiru because she is married to the High King of your Thiru. And so I guess we could call her the High Queen of your Thiru. And uh, the Dalinar, we know, prefers that his wife stay behind when he goes off to battle. And so who would naturally always stay with your Thiru and make sure it's operating well and be tied to your Thiru? Uh, who better than Navani? Uh, and she'll play host as queen. She's already got the established credentials to be the host of your Thiru. It just all comes together and makes sense. And then we have some chapter art. And I love the chapter art. Uh, when I discovered how methodical and logical the chapter art was and how it teased little spoilers. Um, I've just loved it ever since. So on the chapter art, we have Kaladin, who is a windrunner and flies in the sky. And you've got this uh, spear stuck into the sky with a cape blowing in the wind and several other spears around him to represent his squires. Major spoilers all right here, if we only knew back then, right? Uh, and then Shalon's probably even more, spo more spoilery on her chapter art. Uh, she has two different chapter arts. One's of Shadesmar, which her ability allows her to see into, and one is of Pattern, which gives her her ability. And then I believe it was one of the Heralds who had this as his or her chapter art, or maybe all of the Heralds have had this chapter art, but you've got the nine honor blades um, there in they're pretty fabulous looking. Uh, and then for uh, both Eshenai and Vinley, uh, you've got different storms that show them bonding their spren, which is their source of power, their secret to their uh, investiture power. And then the squire's secret to their investiture power is their tie to Bridge Four and to Kaladin through Bridge Four. And so you've got that emblem there. And Moash had his uh, sign ripped off and uh, his power ripped away from that particular aspect for a while. I imagine his chapter art will change in the next book. 
although I could be wrong. Um, and then Adolin has Maya front and center, um, or actually top and center, but uh, we see Maya very proudly displayed in Adolin's chapter art, so he's got her right there, and I believe Adolin will find that Maya will be a source of his power later on. Uh, with Dalinar, uh, it would seem to be implying that the source of his power is perhaps in combining kings and kingdoms together, uniting kings and kingdoms together. Uh, Seth Sansan Vellano has his uh, Nightblood, maybe, or uh, that perhaps that's the, an honor blade, although it certainly looks different from these honor blades, uh, and his shame, bless his heart. And then Lyft, this is a major spoiler too, Lyft, her source of her power is food. Uh, and so here we have Navani's chapter art. Navani's chapter art is a massive and massively powerful Fabriel. So, huh, wonder what that Fabriel could be. Wonder who's inside of that Fabriel. Have you ever seen a Fabriel that's so enormous and so powerful? Hmm, wonder what that could be. Um, and this is the first chapter. This art is shown in the very first full chapter that is a Navani chapter. And the title of the chapter is called Pieces of a Fabriel. And so if that's not spoiler... I don't know what it is. Uh, so I really strongly believe that Navani is going to bond the sibling. I think it will happen as the climax of Rhythm of Horror, uh, that she will bond the sibling. Uh, but if it doesn't happen in this book, if nobody bonds the sibling in this book, I firmly believe that it will happen in the next. That's where we're going with Navani and the sibling and your theory. We come to our very final last Jim Hart theory. We do have a big theory after this one though, but this is the last one that relates to Jim Hart, and this is trapping a god. And so the heralds in the series, the Stormlight series, have been treated as if they are gods, kind of in the Greek fashion or the Roman fashion that you have all of these gods. And we see at the end of Oathbringer that one of these heralds is perhaps killed or perhaps only trapped. We have a quote from King Gavilar in the prologues and he's telling Eshenai as he shows her a Fabriel with a spren trapped inside that with a very special gemstone you can hold even a god. And so uh, I think of particularly Yesrian or Jezrian as some say, uh, when I think of trapping a god or holding a god. And then from Navani, she tells us, and these are in her epigraphs in Rhythm of War, I believe, if the stormlight in a gemstone is withdrawn quickly enough, if it's sucked out quickly enough, a nearby spren can be sucked into the gemstone. Uh, so maybe this is some uh, equity of investiture that you can if you take investiture out of the gemstone, that you need to replace it with investiture from the spring to kind of keep a, a balance there. I don't, I don't know. And then this is, I believe, from another epigraph of Navani's. It is a closely guarded secret of Artifabrians that spring, when trapped, respond differently to different types of metals in different ways. A wire housing for the fabrial called a cage is essential to controlling the device. Uh, and then we also, and this is just kind of a small wild theory of mine that is probably not true, uh, but I really love that just a few chapters before we see Leshwi with this knife we've never seen before that can kill heralds given to Moash. And you kind of ask the question, and everybody was asking the question after Oathbringer, where did this knife come from and why haven't they used it before? Because if they could just kill off the heralds, it seems like they would have already done that already. Um, so I speculate, and I could be completely wrong, uh, but there is something that's called Chekhov's gun. And Chekhov said that if you're watching a play and you see a gun hanging on the wall in Act 1, then that gun needs to go off by Act 3 because you don't want to have any unnecessary elements presented in your story. And I think that's especially true of Brandon, uh, and especially true when you say mundane, and they literally said mundane for the old knife in these letters. Um, you've got this vault that is like 
uh, just hugely guarded. And then you've got a vault within a vault that is like tighter than Fort Knox. Um, there's no way anybody can get in there. And yet somebody gets in there. And inside this vault within a vault that's tighter than Fort Knox, you've got this old knife, this mundane old knife uh, sitting in this vault. And uh, the King's Drop is there. All these priceless gems are there. And then you've got this rusty old knife. Uh, so I wonder if that old knife might be the knife that Leshwe hands to Moash. And the reason they didn't do this before is because they didn't have possession of this knife before. Now, that theory is wild because the masked one the fused who broke into the vault wearing a mask of a of human guard and he died or appears to have died by being shot by Rissen with an arrow so how did the knife get to Leshwe if if that was the case well it would pre be pretty convoluted uh, theory because you would have to have another masked one uh in there and the other masked one would have had to maybe grab the knife and while well, the one that was killed grabbed the king's drop and so you know or something along those lines would have needed to happen for this knife to be the same as the knife that was in the thalen inner vault uh whether that was the knife or not i think that it is especially interesting and especially germane that there are 10 gems for the 10 heralds, 10 different gems for 10 different heralds in the 10 different orders of the Knights Radiant. And Yezrian's gem is a sapphire. So I do not think it by any stretch of the imagination is a coincidence that the sapphire that we see on the knife that killed Yezrian um, is, is just happens to be there. It's definitely there to hold something of Yezrian's uh, because the sapphire is the gem for Yesrian. And just to kind of refresh your memory, it is possible for humans to hold gem heart bonds. Uh, we see it with Asudan and we see it with Amarium. Uh, so Asudan and Amarium both acquire gem heart bonds by swallowing a gem heart that has an unmade inside. Uh, so it is possible for humans to have a gem heart bond. I don't know if the heralds have a gem heart bond, but what I um, do know is that the herald power is not 100% from their honor blades because uh, we see how powerful they are without their honor blades. They haven't had them except town. Has, we haven't had them for 4,500 years. They have not had their honor blades and they're still running around you know, doing stuff. Um, and so we know that their immortality, at least, is not from their honor blades. So what is giving them this massive amount of power? We also know that they don't have a nail bond, that that's not something that they have. Uh, Ishar did not come up with the nail bond until after he uh, had all of his different heralds. So it was only after the heralds were created that the nail bond was created and only recently that any of the heralds have had a nail bond at all and they certainly that's not where their powers from that's not the heraldic power is not from that bond uh and so the oath pack might be where their power comes from but i don't know uh and the i don't i don't think it's the nail bond I don't know if it's a gem heart bond either, but it is possible that uh, th they could have a gem heart because Asudan and Amarium have gem hearts. Uh, and then focusing on the knife that was used, uh, it's described as yellow white, which could be aluminum, but it doesn't have to be aluminum. I think it's some specific type of metal that might be aluminum. Uh, it does have a sapphire hilt, and we hear Yezrian say, it's taking me. And is me his soul? Is it his spren? Uh, is it both? And then, interestingly enough, I think this is a very important comparison. We've got Leshwe's spear. And this is I'm not seen until Rhythm of War. Uh, and in Rhythm of War, she's fighting with this spear. And it's described as being lined with a silvery metal, which, again 
could be aluminum, especially this next part. It says that it resisted shard blade cuts. And so that strongly implies that this is aluminum, although Peter Alstrom has said, and Brandon was sitting right there when he said it, that there are are other possibilities for things that cannot be cut by a shard blade if they were heavily invested, for instance. Uh, so we don't know for absolute certain that that's aluminum, but that's probably a really good guess. Um, my best guess, though, that is whatever the spear is lined with is the same thing that the knife was made of. I think that there is a very strong connection between the spear and the knife. Um, more importantly, it was set with a gemstone at its base. It doesn't say what kind of gemstone. I'm thinking sapphire, but I could be wrong because it doesn't say which kind of gemstone. Um, if the weapon struck Kaladin, the gemstone would suck, does that sound familiar? Away Kaladin's stormlight and render him unable to heal. So it steals investiture from him. And if you had a sprint inside you, it might steal that sprint that was inside you. Cal doesn't have sprint inside him, um, but if he did, it might still that sprint inside. Of course, this is all just conjecture and theory, but I'm I'm thinking that sprint and investiture would both be sucked away from this weapon that Leshwe is holding. And uh, it's, of course, a potentially deadly tool because uh, even if you're infused, then you lose all your stormlight, then you could be killed because you can't heal yourself. So... And then I thought this was interesting, uh, particularly. So when Moesh pulled the knife free, it trailed dark smoke and left a blackened wound. And both of these things are very reminiscent of the way that shard blades kill. And uh, I'll look at a quote of that in just a second. Uh, the large sapphire, the pommel, took on a subdued glow. Uh, and that is exactly the way that we have always seen uh, an inhabited gemstone glow. If a gemstone is inhabited by a spren, it will have a subdued glow. So that's just a huge, huge clue that what Moash did to Yezrian was take away a spren. Uh, I'm not saying that we know that Yezrian even had a spren, but that's what this quote seems to be very, very strongly implying. And then also, um, here's a quote from Way of Kings that tells us what shard blades do. And I think this is very related. So a shard blade killed oddly, and we, we knew that, um, but we may not have remembered the rest of these details. The metal fuzzed when it touched living skin. Um, and I'm leaving part of the quote out, as you can see, just putting in the very important parts. Uh, the man's eyes smoked and burned. So just like smoking and burning up here that uh, we see with Moash's knife, shard blades would make the eyes smoke and burn. Now, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Um, and I think it's particularly relevant, this next bit of the quote, a shard blade did not cut living flesh. It severed the soul itself. So it cut loose the soul itself. Uh, so I don't think a shard blade could permanently have killed Yezrian, but this blade maybe cut his soul loose and maybe that soul, if that soul is invested in the same way a spren is invested, maybe that soul got sucked into the gem heart. That was at the end of the knife pommel. Uh, so maybe it was Yezrian's heavily invested soul, maybe honor specifically invested each of the Herald's souls so that they were like Spren, heavily invested and heavily magical. And so maybe the knife cut free the soul and the the soul was then sucked into the gem heart in the, in the way of sucking out the stormlight from the gem heart um, would suck the soul right into the gem heart uh, because it was so heavily invested. And so the same way that Leshwe's uh, spear uh, sucks investiture in this heavily invested soul could have been sucked into the the gem heart and it could have been that it was the spren of Yezrian so maybe it was just his spren that was giving him immortality and once the spren left he no longer could live because he was 10,000 15,000 years old I don't know but I think it was either a spren or a soul or possibly both that were sucked into the gem heart to give the gem heart that subdued glow to give the sapphire that subdued glow. So that's uh, my gem heart theory on Yesrian. Now, if it were just a spren, 
I don't think this would be true if it were a soul, but if it were just a sprin that got sucked in, um, and if that sprin was what gave the Herald uh, his Windrunner Herald powers, then the question of whether you could take that gemstone and have somebody else swallow that gemstone, uh, and then they would then become the Herald of the Windrunners, Kaladin. Hello, Kaladin. Hello. Um, so uh, I, I like that idea. I, I don't, I do think that new Heralds will happen. I think that it's a greater than 50% chance that new Heralds will happen, especially after the Heralds broke their O's. I think that uh, we may not see a new Herald for town if he recovers his sanity, uh, but I do think that we will see some new Heralds uh, and maybe all new Heralds. Now, I don't know if that's going to be accomplished through a new Oath Pact, probably. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be accomplished by swallowing these gemstones. I, I don't know how that's going to be accomplished, but I think that this might be one of our, one, one additional clue that we're going to see new heralds. We have finished with our gem heart theories, but I do have one final theory that I want to go over, and it's not related to gem heart theories, and it's not related to, probably not related to, Rhythm of War, uh, and that is covering a Harietium, because I think that's a really important theme. I think that we are in the beginnings of Harietium, the last desolation, and so I think that talking about the last desolation could be really kind of cool. Speculating, theorizing about the last desolation could be really cool, and so I have a lot of ideas and theories, uh, but but one big one that is probably pretty controversial. And so um, first, I think that we're going to see a Harietium. I would get, my best guess is book five. And the reason for this is because all of Warren mythology, all of Warren teachings say that uh, we were on Ashen, the Tranquiline Halls, and Ashen was destroyed by the Voidbringers, and the humans had to escape uh, Ashen with with their lives and uh, come to Roshar and, so that they could escape the Voidbringers. It's going to be really important here in a second. Um, so they come to Roshar and they set up camp and they've been on Roshar for thousands and thousands of years now actually. Uh, and Voran teachings say that they're, once the last desolation happens and they defeat the Voidbringers, then the best warriors are going to go back to Ashen and take Ashen back from the Voidbringers. So I think that we've got to leave time for us to go back to Ashen and reclaim the planet Ashen from the Voidbringers that are there. Uh, so uh, we have, Brandon tells us we have two parts to this massive 10 book series. So we've got this massive 10 book series. The first five books are going to be one part and the last five books are going to be another part. I think that the last five books will include going to Ashen, but will also include a little bit of world hopping. I kind of see um, Unite Them that Dalinar keeps being told as not just uniting the humans on Roshar, not just uniting the different Rosharan countries uh, to fight the Voidbringers, not just uniting uh, different worlds to fight the Voidbringers, not just uniting the three shards on Roshar, uh, but actually uniting all 16 shards into one. Uh, and some of them are already united, if you've read other Cosmere books, you know that. Uh, but I think I think that's Wit's end goal, too, is um, that he, they realize that we've got this massively dysfunctional universe um, and massively dysfunctional worlds and even a dysfunctional gods like uh, Odium. We've got all kinds of dysfunction because we don't have one god. And so uh, I think a big part of the last five books will be uniting all of the worlds and uniting all of the shards back into one shard. Uh, and hopefully finding a really good person, uh, Sazed Dalinar, uh, somebody who is just as selfless as they can possibly be uh, to hold the, sh the one shard, the one Adenalsium, the new Adenalsium. Uh, so that's why I think that Har Harietium, uh, fighting the Voidbringers on Roshar, having the last desolation on Roshar, will happen in Book 5. Uh, so let's talk about the girl who looked up. So I think 
I think that most of the stories, especially the stories that are very emphasized, have lots of layers of meaning in the books. Uh, wit stories, I love wit stories, and this is kind of a wit story, although mostly a Shallan story, um, but wit stories of Fleet uh, pushed Callaton to keep going at a time where he really, really needed it. Uh, so I, I think we've got um, just a tremendous amount of buried metaphors in these stories uh, that just make them so tremendously, wonderfully, amazingly powerful. And The Girl Who Looked Up is perhaps my favorite story. So we get from The Girl Who Looked Up, and this is of course not the entire story, um, but why is there a wall to keep bad things out, to keep out very bad things? Why is there a wall to protect us from the very bad things? Why is there a wall what wall? So you've got kind of this story of this little girl running around talking about this wall. And everybody's like, oh, we built a wall to keep out the bad things because they're really bad things out there, but we're really good. Um, and, and that's every people. They see themselves as the good guys and the other people as the bad guys. So uh, just ask anybody. They're one of the good guys. Uh, but the story ends up she, when she gets to the top of the wall, she realizes that the wall wasn't to keep others from getting to them. They had steps up to to that wall, but they never came because they were the bad guys. She was part of the monsters. Uh, and, and so I think this is not just some little cute story of, oh, that's cute. It doesn't have any actual application to Roshar in life. I don't think that's the way this, this story works. I think that what Brandon is saying here is this huge, huge hint that we are the monsters. The humans, whom we relate to as human, uh, have spent all this time building your Thiru, and they'll spend more time trying to get your Thiru to work, uh, building the Knights Radiant and uniting the Knights Radiant and trying to get the, uni the Knights Radiant to learn their powers and to fight, um, to defeat the Voidbringers. All of this is in the name of defeating the Voidbringers, those nasty, horrible, Parshendi monsters that are out there. We've got to defeat the Voidbringers. We've got to, to learn to defeat the Voidbringers. We've got to use everything that we have. We've got to kill, find out how to kill or trap the Voidbringers. We've got to get rid of the Voidbringers. But the Voidbringers aren't the Parshendi. Um, and you say, whoa, yes, of course the Voidbringers are the Pershindi. We call them the Voidbringers, therefore they must be the Pershindi. Well, uh, Voranism talks about reclaiming the Tranquiline Halls from the Voidbringers and says that the Voidbringers destroyed the Tranquiline Halls. And guess who's never been on Ashen? Guess who's never seen the Tranquiline Halls? The Singers, the Pershindi, the Parchment. They have never been off Roshar. They are native to Roshar. The humans invaded Roshar and took over their planet. And yeah, so the humans were the Voidbringers on Ashen. The humans were the first to bring the first desolation. We also know, uh, and this is huge too, and I think these two things together or what created the recreants, what dis made the Knights Radiant decide, hey, why are we bothering with all this stuff when we humans are the Voidbringers? This is insane. Why are we trying to fight the Parshendi? Why are we doing all of this if we are the Voidbringers? So I think that uh, this created the recreants. I think that this is the information that created the recreants. Uh, so also the Shattered Plains was the largest Rosharan desolation that I believe we've ever seen because it's the largest evidence of a desolation that we see on all of Roshar are these massive shattered plains. Uh, so even if you look at the shattered plains and you think about what Dalinar said in his vision that Honor showed him of the desolations where they're standing on a plateau, right? I think it's even described as a plateau. Um, and he looks off and he sees the void um, and he sees all the earth around him being destroyed and blown up and and exploding into dust, all of the, the bedrock and the soil and the earth um, and everything is just exploding into into dust. That's what happened to the Shattered Plains, but on a smaller scale. Uh, so not completely blown away. There are lots of massive plateaus, but partially blown away because of the holes that you see between the plateaus, the crevices the, um, that you see between the plateaus, the chasms. Uh, 
Uh, so here we have from the listener song of wars, they blame our people for the loss of that land, the city that once covered it did range the eastern strand, the power made known in the tomes of our clan, our gods were not who shattered these plains. And, you know, they say it, but do you believe it? I actually do believe it, uh, because they weren't particularly being accused of shattering the plains when they claimed that this was true. So uh, their gods, the fused, were not who shattered the plains. And so the Prashindi were not who shattered the plains, because the only Prashindi who have the power to be able to do something like that would be the surge-finding Prashindi, who uh, are the fused. And then this quote, I loved this quote. Uh, I didn't realize how important it was the first two times I read Words of Radiance, but this third time that I've read it in preparation for Rhythm of War, I uh, have really, really loved it. Uh, at the center of these plains, there was a city. Something broke it apart. A weapon. And I love that word weapon. And we'll come back to, to seeing a weapon later on vibrations and i love that idea too because she's of course thinking of somatics that the ardent had showed her um and somatics is a real thing you should look at uh, some youtube videos showing somatics where they take sand and put it on a very thin plate and put it on top of a, a woofer speaker or subwoofer speaker and uh, then blast it with some tones and the different tones will do different patterns and it's just so cool to watch uh, and thinking about tones and rhythms uh, reminds you maybe of rhythm of war and the tones that Navani is hearing whenever Dalinar opens a perpendicularity or the uh, rhythms and tones that all of the Barshindi hear all of the time. Uh, and so perhaps uh, Capsule was right in saying that the cities were created by these special tones that uh, could move sand on a plate. But in order to be able to move the earth, you would need really powerful tones, or maybe you'd need a little help from surge binding that would reduce the friction of the earth between each other so that these tones could actually work. Certainly, uh, it would require some surge binding capabilities to be able to create these cities or to be able to create something like the shattered plains would require surge binding abilities but it wasn't it was not the uh, parshindi it was not the fused who created the shattered plains uh, and then these are quotes on the desolations and i believe this is from a Dalinar vision, a final wave of destruction. So destruction is used a lot to describe the desolations. Rolled across the lands like a high storm. The destruction raged around him, vaporizing rocks. So rocks just went to nothing, went, went to absolutely nothing. Um, and that reminds us of the Shattered Plains, right? Um, the Shalon quote uh, says that stone became sand. So you've got vibrations, you've got somatics, uh, stone became sand. And I thought that was so important. So uh, all of these crevices, all of these chasms were created because the stone that's between them became sand and then it got blown away by the various high storms that have happened for thousands of years since the shattering of the plains. Uh, and then uh, a final wave of destruction destruction raged around him, vaporizing rocks. That sounds exactly like what happened on the shattered plains on a smaller scale um, than, you know, ashen but certainly on a larger scale than any of the rest of Roshar seems to have gone through because we don't see shattering of earth on any of the rest of Roshar. And this is a quote that was given by an ardent uh, for uh, Dalinar. She was Dalinar's ardent and she was a specialist on the desolations. And when asked, she said they were destruction made manifest right lord each one was so profoundly devastating that humankind was left broken and then in the ars arcanum uh in the back of every book the surge of division which by the way would be one of the nine brands so we don't know we haven't seen them named we haven't seen them yet uh, but one of the nine fused brands would have this surge of division uh, and we also know that this surge 
is from the Dustbringers and from the Skybreakers. Uh, but if you look at the Knight's Radiant quiz, uh, the description of Skybreakers, it seems fairly innocuous, fairly unharmful. Uh, so it, I think you should probably look at the Night Radiant quiz descriptors. We're going to look at the Dustbringer one, um, some of the quotes from it. Um, but if you look at Dustbringers and compare them to the other orders of the Night's Radiant, even the order that shares the Destruction Surge, uh, you'll see that there is a vast difference between the way the Dustbringers are described and the way the Skybreakers are described. So I thought that was particularly interesting. So here is that quiz, the Radiant quiz. Uh, the Dustbringers are taught greater powers of what's the word destruction the same word that's associated with desolation uh, so they're taught greater powers that will enable them to bring a desolation uh, as they progress in their oaths and they are one of the only orders where their abilities aren't all available at the very beginning so most desolations we probably have seen deathbringers that only made it to their second or third oaths. Um, we probably have not seen any Dustbringers that have made it to their full five oaths. Maybe the Shattered Plains, and, and that's speculation, maybe that's not true. Um, maybe we've only seen good Dustbringers make it to all five oaths. Um, maybe the Shattered Plains was where somebody made it to a third or fourth oath and uh, they shattered the plains. And um, this is described Dustbringers are described as attracting tinkerers, which could be great, you know, who like to dig down into the shape of things, a soul of a thing. Um, they like to break it. And that that sounded troublesome to me um, and see what makes it work. So breaking an inanimate object might not be so bad. But uh, what if you're like Balot, who likes to tear apart animals. Uh, that seems a little serial killer to me. Uh, it also attracts the foolhardy, which seems like a very bad combination to me to have greater powers of destruction bestowed upon the fools. Um, so a bad combination waiting to happen right there. And then uh, th this is just a wealth of information on the quiz descriptions of the different uh, orders of the Knights Radiant. They say that they need to be able to control, contain, and channel the terrible power inside them. Terrible power inside them. Wow. Wow. These these are the Slytherins of Roshar, for sure. Uh, so they you could be sorted into the Deathbringer house, or the Deathbringer order, uh, and actually be a good person. And we better hope that that's every Deathbringer, but I don't think it will be. I think we will see a desolation, and I think it will be that the hands of Deathbringers, just look at them. By the way, this is an absolutely fabulous uh, piece of art. Steve Argyle's art is amazing. Uh, you should visit his website and, and look at the art that he's done. Navani is probably my favorite, um, and I've included her earlier, uh, but this is pretty epic and cool, too. Uh, but just, I mean, just look at them. They just look evil right um and and the sound based on the quiz descriptions that brandon sanderson presumably wrote or at least approved uh so they're they are the slytherins <laughs> um they don't see themselves as being about destruction of course uh no one sees themselves as monsters uh though their powers are the most destructive of any order of the nice radiant i mean you know and they're the only ones, this is the only one that talks about even being destructive. Uh, and then, oh, I like this last one the best because it comes back to weapons. And remember, Shalon earlier said that the planes were shattered by some sort of weapon. Well, what are the weapons that are on Rishar? They are the Dustbringers. So uh, the Dustbringers act as artillery and uh, another word for artillery is weapons in any modern army. Um, so uh, if you want a large swath of land completely obliterated and destroyed uh, or burned, they could do either. Um, and, and this last part is, is me. It's not them. It's not Brandon Sanderson didn't make a, a Ghostbusters analogy, but I'm like, who are you going to call? Um, Dust bringers. So uh, I think that the Dust bringers definitely have the potential if they make it to all five O's, and especially if there's several of them putting their powers together, making it to all five O's, they have the complete potential to destroy the world. And I think it's of note that even the Skybreakers, 
who have the same surge, uh, they don't they don't have the ability to destroy the world. That's not mentioned in their uh, radiant quiz descriptions at all. Destructive, I probably I don't think destructive or any synonym is mentioned there. Uh, they may talk about how bad. Uh, nail is and and that's only because he's crazy is what it says so skybreakers aren't inherently bad people it's just that there are a few who are now following the crazy crazy insane nail who's gone insane by being tortured um that they have defected to odium but what if what if some dustbringers defect to odium the only dustbringer i believe that we know is malata and you know i would not trust malata with anything i would not give her anything that I valued to trust with. She seems like a Slytherin. <laughs> she seems exactly like a Slytherin. So I would not trust her at all. So is she going to defect to Odium? Or is she already a spy for Odium? Was she already a spy for Teravangian, who was a spy for Odium? Uh, yeah, I think that's highly likely uh, that she's already working for Odium and spying for Odium. So yeah, uh, and if you Odium has a whole bunch of Dustbringers that make it to the fifth oath, then they can totally obliterate Roshar and drive the humans off of Roshar and perhaps back to Ashen or perhaps back to some other world. Interestingly, we see already Marais hunting for a way and Shallan hunting for a way and Gavilar of old who had found a little bit of an edge of a way to get off of Roshar even if you had investiture tied to Roshar so uh the you know hopefully they the Knights Radiant and the Heralds will be able to escape at least to Ashen or Braze um better Ashen maybe than Braze and uh but I think eventually they'll be able to world hop just like Wit does so uh we've got a lot of a lot of groundwork that's laid for we are the monsters the humans are the monsters and the humans are the void bringers certainly they were undisputably the void bringers who destroyed ashen and i believe that it's hard to dispute that they were also the void bringers who shattered the planes um the humans were the void bringers who shattered the planes in that desolation uh, brought that desolation so uh it seems to me very logical that they are the ones who will bring a Harietium, the final desolation uh and destroy roshar in the same way that they destroyed ashen uh, so thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed these theories. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the artwork too. The amazing artwork, uh, though, is definitely not mine. It all belongs to uh, Brandon Sanderson's artist and to perhaps Brandon Sanderson uh, and perhaps to his publisher. There's some fan art as well. Please drop me a line below in the comment section and tell me what your favorite theories are what you think will happen in the rhythm of war book and in the books that follow i'd love to hear from you thank you so much